So welcome everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunch break. Uh, uh, sorry, the coffee break, the coffee break. I'm already thinking uh, about the lunch. Uh, so welcome to our uh, second panel for today. Uh, it's characterized by three L's, law, land, and language. Uh, I'm Bilal Orfali, uh, professor of Arabic in the Arabic department Ubi. here at AUB. We have three speakers uh, for this morning. Uh, each of them will have 20 to 25 minutes uh, because we have a very tight schedule before the lunch break. Uh, then we can probably accommodate two or three questions uh, before we conclude the panel. Our first speaker, uh, I'm sure you all know each other by now. You've looked at uh, the bio at uh, the end of uh, the booklet, so I will not uh, introduce our uh, Sahih. Less is more. Less is more. <laughs> so our first speaker is uh, Baki Tishkan from the University of California, Davis, USA. And his talk uh, is uh, entitled Rumi's in the Ottoman Imperial Judiciary of Arab Lands and Arabs in the Imperial Mosques of Istanbul. So please help me in welcoming uh, Professor Tashkan. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I would like to start by thanking the organizers of the conference, especially my colleague Ali and Professor Abu Hussein and Mr. Nazi, uh, who was so helpful with everything, uh, for uh, organizing, inviting me. Thank you. This morning, the focus of my presentation will be a prosopographical study of the Ottoman chief judges of Aleppo and Cairo during the roughly 100-year period from 1550 to 1655. The written version of the presentation will, inshallah, include the chief judges of Damascus as well. Let me first start by providing you with the context of my research question. We have convened here to evaluate the impact of the Ottoman conquest of the Memluk Empire on the region. As one of my dearest professors, Rifat Abul Hajj, noted, the Ottoman past of Arab lands has been evaluated by Arab scholars in different ways throughout the 20th century. I myself grapple with finding a conceptual model that could be used as a tool to describe the relationship between Istanbul and the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire, especially Egypt and the greater Syria. If one were to look at the annual summaries of Ottoman treasury accounts indicating the income and expenditure of the central treasury, it appears that a wealth transfer took place from Egypt and the greater Syria to Istanbul, at least in the 16th century. These figures are from the late Halil Inaljik's monumental study, the first volume of an economic and social history of the Ottoman Empire. This transfer of, re or, uh, this transfer of resources continued, at least as far as Egypt is concerned, all the way to the late 19th century, as I was recently reminded by Amy Janel, that Egypt continued to send funds to Istanbul even during the British protectorate although these funds did not enter Ottoman coffers as they were used to pay the Ottoman debt to European powers. Thus, it would not be wrong to state that the Ottoman capital exploited the financial resources of at least some of the Arab lands to pay for the expenditures elsewhere in the empire. I'm well aware of the fact that Ottomans also invested resources in Arab lands, as can be discerned from the numerous foundations that were established to fund the various charitable establishments, such as mosques, madrasas, soup kitchens, caravansarais, and the like in these lands. Of course, one might argue that had the resources of Egypt and the greater Syria been fully reinvested in those lands, one could probably build more of them. Yet, as Professor al Jubaz's uh, uh, presentation demonstrated, some parts of Syria were actually better funded by the Ottomans than they were by the Mamluks. So there, more research is needed to uh, come to a conclusion. Should we look at the portrait of the f just financial exploitation and call the relationship between Istanbul and the Arab lands a colonial one? I would not go that far, for the relationship between Istanbul and many Anatolian and Balkan provinces were not that different. The financial exploitation of agriculture and trade mainly paid for the army, navy, and the imperial administrators. This was the case for, say, Bolu in Anatolia, just as it was for Beirut. I should add that this was pretty much the case for all pre-modern imperial centers and their peripheries in world history. Another way to look at the relationship between Istanbul and its many provinces may be through the distribution of political patronage. 
did Ottoman subjects have equal access to opportunities that would make them part of the ruling class? By the time Egypt and the greater Syria became part of the Ottoman Empire, the higher ranking administrators of the empire were mostly of Devshirme origin. That is, they were drawn from among the Christian subjects, mostly in the Balkans, some of whom were handpicked by imperial administrators to join the army or the administrative hierarchy and converted to Islam. Thus, a Muslim city dweller in Bolu and another one in Beirut were equally excluded from opportunities to join the upper ranks of the Ottoman administration. While the Devshirme monopoly in the upper ranks of the imperial administration started breaking down in the late 16th century and eventually disappeared completely by the 18th century, which led to the entry of commoners into the ruling class that I very much emphasized in my earlier work, for the purposes of this paper, which is meant to tackle the transition from the Mamluks to the Ottomans, I would like to continue working with the assumption of a Devshirme monopoly, as the Ottoman Devshirmes were comparable to the Egyptian and Syrian Mamluks in excluding the Muslim majority from higher positions of power. Otherwise, one could easily argue that the Ottoman rule turned out to be beneficial to the development of Arab political leaders, as many of them came to rule the greater Syria as local governors in the 18th century, and in some localities like parts of modern Lebanon even earlier. Even at the height of the Devshirme monopoly of administrative position, however, there always was a way that offered a certain degree of upward mobility to Muslim commoners, both in the Memluk and Ottoman empires, education and madrasas. Theoretically speaking, one could study hard and become a professor of law or a judge and thus join the ruling class in its low to mid ranks. Some of these judges uh, could eventually attain high rank and have access to empire-wide power networks. The research question I'm trying to answer today is whether Muslim subjects in Arab lands had the same opportunity as the ones in Anatolia in reaching high ranks in the Ottoman judicial hierarchy. And if they did not, why? Abdul Karim Rafak, in his seminal study, Relations Between the Syrian Ulama and the Ottoman State, stated that the Ottomans appointed Rumis as the Hanafi chief judge of provincial capitals. I will try to provide some more statistical details and geographical scope to this answer by concentrating on the chief judgeships of two major Arab cities, Aleppo and Cairo, this morning. My research confirms a tendency that has already been noted in several studies. The Ottoman judicial establishment in the pre-modern period was quite tightly controlled in the hands of certain families on the upper levels of the educational judicial hierarchy and yet gradually opened up to others in the lower levels. The prosopographical research I will present to you this morning suggests that the relative openness in the lower levels was limited geographically. That is, aspiring scholars from Anatolia and to a lesser degree the Balkans had a higher chance in entering this hierarchy than those from the Arab provinces. In the concluding section, I will speculate as to why this might have been the case. In part, uh, thanks to the work of my graduate school mentor, Norman Itzkowitz, I have been interested in prosopographical studies of the Ottoman ulama for some time. Uh, in a previous work, I studied the very top of the Ottoman ulama establishment, that is the senior justices of the Asian and African provinces, Anadolu Kada Askeri, senior justices of the European provinces, Rumeli Kada Askeri, and the grand or imperial muftis, Sheikhul Islam, who held office between 1550 and 1650. This study, which included 81 individuals, demonstrated that almost half of the scholars who occupied positions at the very summit of the Ottoman educational judicial hierarchy between 1550 and 1650 came from some 11 families. About four out of five men, 79% in the whole group, were related to others who had previously held a position in the state apparatus or the court. A small group of 21% were upstarts, lucky enough to obtain the protection and support of a powerful patron. Using this data, I argued that it is possible to see the Ottoman mevali, that is the higher ranking judges of the Ottoman Empire, as a sort of aristocracy and suggested that we might call them what the term mevali uh, implies, the lords of the law. My results were very much in line with those of Madeleine Zilfi, uh, who studied the Ottoman ulama of the 18th century and emphasized the concentration of the higher positions in the hands of a limited number of families. This relative monopoly on top positions is not difficult to explain. At least from the early years of the reign of Suleiman on, all of the professors in the major colleges of law in Anatolia and the Balkans, as well as the judges, were appointed by the imperial center. There was a hierarchical order among the colleges. Uh, and here, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, go a little bit faster. 
So if you start teaching at a college of 20, excuse me? Oh, all right. Okay. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, so what one, a student would, a student who didn't have any backing would have to start at a college of 20, uh, 20 meaning the mudarris teaching there receives 20 akchas a day. Uh, so then he would go study with a different mudarris at a college of 25, college of 30, 40, 50, 60 eventually. And then he would wait for a mulazamet, uh, sort of a, a license to teach. And that was actually more difficult to secure than a, a sort of being a student of somebody because you had to know somebody really powerful, high up. Only the very top guys were able to issue mulazamets. And that was what the way in which sort of who can enter was filtered. Uh, once the mulazamet was secured, then the, the student would become a professor and then do the same hierarchy as he was a student, first teach at a college of 20, then 25, then 30, then 40, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, an alternative could be becoming a judge at a small town while you are teaching at a college of 20 or 25. You could skip any more and then become a judge, but then you would remain a small town judge. If you want to have a big judgeship, you really had to go all the way up, teach at the Dahil colleges, and then get a judgeship that which would give you access to uh, the appointments in the highest uh, paying uh, judgeships, which started with Aleppo, Damascus, Cairo, Bursa, Edirne, and Istanbul. Mecca and Medina were added to this list too. And then people who uh, served in Istanbul become, would become the Asian uh, senior justice, and then uh, European senior justice, and then some of them would become Shaykhul Islam. So this was the hierarchy. Uh, on the lower levels, though, on the lower levels, the, the, the upper levels were controlled and tight, but Denise Klein uh, in an M80 is in Germany, the Osmanische Ulema, the 17th Jahrhundert, and the Geschlossene Gesellschaft. In this study, she shows that the lower levels were actually more open, so more newcomers could come from the lower levels. She used Ushakizade Zeyli Shakaik as her source. I wondered whether the chief judgeships of Aleppo and Cairo would be sufficiently lower than the positions of the Grand Mufti and the senior justices of the Asian and European provinces so that one could observe a relatively higher representation of newcomers among them who might perhaps include some local Arabs. It turns out that this is not quite the case. But the figures are still interesting as they provide some further details to our knowledge. Although there were 150 in altogether, I'm sorry, altogether there were 100, 150 individuals who were appointed to these two posts, Aleppo and Cairo, uh, between 1550 and 1655. I chose this period for the existence of continuous and reliable data in the biographical dictionaries of Atayi and Sheikhi, and my intention to reach a round number of appointees, 150. Conf uh, some of these individuals served in both judgeships. Some of them served more than once. Uh, confirming some of the earlier findings, I observed that some families were very heavily represented. So, for instance, there were six different Bostanzades among these 150 individuals, three Karachelebizades, three Ushakezades. So, there are certain families that come up often. A total of 101 appointees were related to other members of the Ottoman educational judicial establishment. 15 others were connected with other types of Ottoman officials. Um, so out of 100, 116 out of the 150 appointees, which would make 77%, had an advantage to their peers that helped them to move faster and reach a high-ranking judgeship like the ones of Aleppo and Cairo. If we compare this figure with the earlier one, we can observe that the monopoly of the privileged members of the ulama is still quite clear in the chief judgeships of Aleppo and Egypt, which are actually four or five steps below the position of a senior justice, that is a kadasker. The positions of the Ottoman chief judges of Aleppo and Cairo are only a tiny bit more open to upstarts than those of the kadaskers and the Grand Mufti, 23% as opposed to 21 if one were to conduct this study in a later period, one would probably find a larger degree of openness, as most of the commoners I identified among the Ottoman chief judges of Aleppo and Egypt 
were appointed in the second half of the period I studied. Now I would like to add a couple of dimensions to this general portrait of the Ottoman ulama, not really to revise it, but rather to supplement it with some further details which actually support the argument for the relative hegemony on the upper levels and the relative openness in the lower levels. These details will also introduce another element to the larger portrait, the geographical hegemony of Anatolia and the Balkans as the birthplace of, of the Ottoman ulama in the higher ranks. There were already altogether 34 chief judges of Aleppo and Cairo in the period 1550 to 1655 who did not have any relation to the members of the Ottoman educational judicial hierarchy or the Ottoman state apparatus. Two of them were from the Ayyub district of Istanbul, 15 from Anatolia, including Kurdistan, and nine from the Balkans, accounting for 26 out of the 34 appointees, that is 76%. Six appointees were immigrants from farther east, such as Nahchivan, Karabakh, and Shirvan. The number of upstart appointees who were born in the Arab lands of the Ottoman Empire was only two, one from Aleppo and the other from Syriacus near Cairo. This is not an isolated phenomena that is only observable at the top of the Ottoman educational judicial hierarchy, though. I conducted a similar survey among the newcomers within the 160 professors who taught at the College of Mehmet II, Sahna Seman, in the roughly 30-year period between 1574 and 1603 as part of a yet unpublished study uh, at a different conference presentation, almost half of the professors who held an appointment at the Sahna Seman during these 30 years did not have any relatives who could help them in an Ottoman ulama career, 78 to be exact, which clearly shows that newcomers did have an almost fair chance to compete with their more advantaged peers to secure an appointment at this prestigious College of Law in Istanbul. Here, I must emphasize the significance of an appointment at the College of Mehmet II for one's, futures, uh, one's future career. Out of the 150 appointees to the chief judgeships of Aleppo and Cairo in the roughly 100-year period between 1550 and 1655, 142, that is 95%, had taught at this college earlier in their careers. So you had to teach here to be able to then become uh, a judge in Aleppo or Cairo. Now, in this particular uh, professorship, you have non-privileged professors, uh, the, what I call non-privileged, 78 of them, the newcomers. One can identify the geographical origins of 68. This is the period from 1574-1603. Out of these 68 professors, 52, that is more than three quarters of the group, originated from the lands of the empire that correspond to modern Turkey. Seven came from the Balkans, one from Crimea, one from Western Persia, Raqqa Ajam, another one from Transoxiana, three from the Caucasus, and another three were of slave origin, one of whom was identified as a Croatian. And most of the 52 professors who originated from the lands of the empire that corresponds to modern Turkey came from central, northern, and northern, southern, and western Anatolia with only three professors from the east and southeast. That is, uh, in this case, Antakya, Marash, and Wan. Um, in short, at mid-career levels in the late 16th century, even though there is more social mobility for sure, there seems to be different institutional barriers in place that privilege the western part of Anatolia and practically exclude the Arab provinces and North Africa. In the concluding section of my presentation, I would like to speculate about the reasons of this near exclusion. While it is not easy to account for all the factors that contribute to the creation of such a tight focus on Anatolia and a seeming exclusion of the Arab provinces, an easy one to identify relates to access. Several that is, 11 out of 68 or 16 percent of the Sahna Seman professors of humble origins in my data pool secured their licenses to teach from Ataullah Efendi, the teacher of Selim II. Ataullah Efendi had himself strong ties to Anatolia. He was from Birgi in Western Anatolia, where he also endowed a madrasa. And he seems to have acted like a clearinghouse for many professors of humble origins from Anatolia and the Balkans. One can imagine how a Western Anatolian student of law might have had a professor who knew another Western Anatolian scholar like Ataullah, but it would be very difficult to imagine how an Arab student, say in Aleppo or Cairo, 
could find a way of reaching out to someone like Ataullah Efendi for a teaching license. Let me share an anecdote to illustrate the difficulties faced by Arab students of law. My anecdotal example is the famous 17th century Damascene scholar, Muhammad al-Amin uh, al-Muhibbi, Izzeti Mehmed Efendi, the nephew of a former Sheikh al-Islam, while he was the judge of Damascus in 1654-55, he had promised Fadlullah al-Muhibbi that he would grant a teaching license to his son, Muhammad al-Amin, in due course. In 1668, when Izzeti Efendi became the senior justice of the Asian provinces, he kept his promise and sent a teaching license to the young al-Muhibbi. So the young al-Muhibbi didn't have to go through all of the colleges. He received a teaching license by mail uh, because the uh, senior justice trusted uh, that he would have received a good education. And then he got a teaching appointment in Bursa. In 1669, Izeti, uh, his patron became the chief justice of the European provinces and promoted his young protege to a slightly higher ranking college. But Izzeti's days in office did not last long. The young Al Muhibbi stayed with Izzeti in Istanbul during the latter's retirement, hoping that his patron would be reappointed and he could get an appointment to a college in the Ottoman capital. Yet Izzeti died in 1681. Having lost his patron, Al Muhibbi left Istanbul for his hometown. There, he engaged in scholarship and produced quite a number of works on literature and history, among which his biographical dictionary, Khulasa al Asar, is one of the most frequently quoted sources for the history of the Eastern Mediterranean in the 17th century. Thus, even if one were lucky enough to get to know a member of the Ottoman educational judicial hierarchy in the Arab provinces, once that member lost his position, there was no one to fall back onto, whereas someone who went through the colleges in Istanbul as a student, would have his peers and other professors to seek help from. Let me take a moment to state something as a side note here, though. I'm actually very glad that Al Muhibbi did not do well in Istanbul, because had he done well, he would be too busy with the politics of appointments to write any of his works. The biographies of most Ottoman professors and judges in the central lands of the empire read like a register of official appointments, whereas the biographies of Arab scholars in Arabic biographical dictionaries of the uh, greater Syria, they're actually full of written works, some of which, like al muhibbis became key works for centuries to come. Other than this practical question of access, there was a larger issue affecting Arab students that relates to the politics of Ottoman law, I think. The Ottoman lands had not always been unwelcoming towards scholars from different parts of the Islamic world. A well-known Syrian scholar of Hadith in Qara'a, Ibn al-Jazari, was most welcome in Bursa during the reign of Bayezid I and even joined the Sultan in some of his military expeditions, including the Battle of Ankara, after he, which he was taken to Central Asia by Timur. Bayezid's uh, grandson, Murat II, consulted uh, all the four chief judges of Cairo, representing the four schools of Sunni law, before he attacked the Karaman Principality in Anatolia in order to legitimize his war against another Muslim polity. Murad II also welcomed Mullah Gurani, who had immigrated from Cairo and appointed him to mentor his son, Prince Mehmet, the future conqueror of Constantinople. And there are other examples. I will uh, not dwell on every one of them, but what is important to note is that this trend changes. As the Ottoman scholarly establishment grew and the Ottomans came to see themselves as the political leaders of the Islamic world, their patronage became more restricted. So for instance, we have Muslihit al Lari, uh, who had been the tutor of the Mughal Emperor Humayun. He arrives in the late 1550s in Istanbul. He has a letter of introduction from the Ottoman chief judge of Mecca. He is a great scholar, but he doesn't receive any patronage in Istanbul. He ends up in Ahmed, the capital of Diyarbakr, and Baghdad, mostly under the patronage of Iskandar Pasha, a general of Suleiman and the governor of Diyarbakr and later Baghdad. The great commentator of Ali Kushi's work on astronomy was not able to secure the patronage of the great-grandson of Mehmed II, who had pa patronized uh, Ali Kushi. Uh, and there are other examples again here, too. Scholars who originated from the farther ends of the Ottoman domains did not fare much better either. We have a few examples, such as Ali ibn Hamza al-Maghribi, a great scholar, has a work on the mathematics, but 
is not able to uh, receive a lot of patronage in Istanbul. What happened then between the mid 15th century when the Ottoman center was much more open to foreign born scholars and the mid 16th century when some of those foreign lands had actually become Ottoman territory? One of the important changes was the consolidation of Turkish as the main administrative as well as legal language, which created a certain degree of hindrance to Arab scholars. But I believe the larger part of the answer has to do with the political relationship between the Ottoman state and the law. As argued by Guy Burak in his recent book, The Second Formation of Islamic Law, the Ottoman center took an active part in shaping the structure and doctrine of a particular branch within the Hanafi school of law. Burak shows how Ottoman scholars in Anatolia and the Balkans came to support the development of what might be called an official school of law by rewriting the history of Hanafi law and also interpreting it in ways that facilitated a sort of pre-modern codification which allowed quite questionable practices such as the cash waqf that legitimized a certain practice of interest in the marketplace. Burak also demonstrates how Hanafi, Hanafi scholars in the Arab lands of the empire opposed some of these developments, such as the appointment of official muftis uh, uh, to provinces. In short, the Ottomans were interested in centralizing the interpretation of the law, while the legal tradition in the Arab lands of the empire privileged a larger degree of pluralism, which is actually more in line with the early development of the law in the Islamic world. A very fitting example to the point I'm making is provided by Abdul Karim Rafak. Uh, the Ottoman feudal system was based on the idea that peasants had to stay where they were born. A fief holder, that is a Timar Lisipai or Timariot, had the right to bring back peasant, peasants who moved elsewhere back to their original villages. So we, here we see uh, um, Professor Rafak quotes, uh, um, this is uh, him, uh, he basically explains how there were a lot of Timar holders who would go bring peasants back to their original villages by sultanic orders, and the judges had to approve this. But the local ulama, uh, they contended that a Muslim is free to live wherever he desires. They quoted the example of the Prophet Muhammad, who himself fled Mecca to Medina to avoid persecution, and who ordered the Muslims to flee their original homeland if they were coerced, and to settle wherever they found goodness. On the legal side, the ulama absolved the villagers from the responsibility of going back to their original villages to work on the land there, whether that land was freehold, endowment, or state. Clearly, the Ottomans expected their jurists to privilege the interests of the state, as opposed to those of the individual subject, when it came to a clash between the two. I believe it was the significance of this political interpretation of the Hanafi law that led the Ottomans to privilege the students at the legal colleges in Anatolia and the Balkans in choosing appointees to professorships in the central lands of the empire, where they kept a close watch at the curriculum. Similarly, they wanted to appoint judges and chief judges who would not challenge the centralizing tendencies that privilege the interests of the state over those of the individual. The best candidates would be the ones who went through an education that was provided by those scholars who had internalized that status tendency, that is, again, the students of Anatolian and Balkan colleges of law, especially the ones in Istanbul where the impact of the status tendency was felt most strongly. The colleges of law in Arab lands where legal pluralism, pluralism had been en enshrined in the representation of four schools of Sunni law in the Mamluk Empire and where even Hanafis dared to challenge the Ottoman center were not fertile ground for the Ottomans' more statist conception of the law to take root. Even some Ottoman legal practices were not holding root there. For instance, the permission granted to cash waqfs did not become as popular in the Arab provinces as it did in Anatolia and the Balkans. Thus, the Ottoman center allowed a certain degree of autonomy to the way in which law was interpreted, taught, and even applied sometimes in Arab lands, but in return did not grant these interpreters the same status that it did to the ones in the imperial capital. Let me finish by touching uh, upon the second half of my title that I could not get to during this presentation because of time constraints. Some scholars might be inclined to explain the near exclusion of the scholars of Arab lands from the higher ranks of the Ottoman imperial judiciary by referring to a pre-modern version of ethnic tension between Arabs and Turks. I would not agree with them as there are not only some successful Arab scholars who made careers for themselves and their families in the Ottoman judicial hierarchy. An example I did not touch upon is the, uh, the family of Sharani Zadeh, who were related to the well-known Egyptian Sufi, uh, Abdul Wahab al Sharani. But there are several well-known reciters of the Quran, imams and preachers, who serve sultans 
or came to be liked by the masses in Istanbul in the 16th and 17th centuries who were of Arab origin from Damascus, uh, from Cairo. One of the key texts of Ottoman jurisprudence, Multaqa al-Abkhur, was written by one of them, Ibrahim al-Halabi. Thus, non-legal careers that are related to Muslim practices such as leading prayers, offering sermons, and reciting the Quran were much more welcoming to scholars of Arab lands than the legal ones. Another crucial point to note here is that the Turkish-speaking Ottoman jurists were not even called Turks, but referred to as Rumis in Arabic sources, which emphasized not the ethnic, but the geographical, and arguably the imperial Roman character of the Ottoman administrator and judges and the law they represented. Thus, unlike modern colonialism in which the construction of ethnic and racial differences played a key role in the political relationship between the imperial center and the colony, the relationship between the Ottoman center and the Arab lands might perhaps be conceptualized as legal imperialism, in which the center asserts the superiority of its own political interpretation of the law, but does not attempt to transform the interpretation of the law in the periphery, leaving it, to a certain degree, autonomous. And yet, by the very act of granting a limited degree of autonomy to the interpretation of the law in the periphery, the center produces a certain power differential as the peripheral interpreters are not able to exert much influence on the interpreters of the law at the center while the latter reign over the former. Many thanks for your patience. Thank you, uh, Professor Tashkan, for this uh, very well-researched paper. Our second speaker for uh, this panel is uh, Dr. Zashan Forat from Istanbul University. Her title is Egyptian Ulama in Istanbul after the conquest of Egypt. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Forat. I just want to thank uh, all of you for uh, being here. And I also want to extend my thanks to the organizers, of course, uh, to Professor Ebu Hussein for inviting me to this amazing conference. And I hope that uh, you enjoy it so far. And just want to use the time a little bit uh, economically. I just want to cut it very short and make it very simple. My topic is about the scholars in exile in Istanbul. Uh, we all know that actually uh, after the conquest of uh, Egypt, Selim I uh, took many uh, people, many prominent uh, figures from Cairo to Istanbul. And uh, most of the people are arguing about it uh, in their academic uh, writings. However, uh, we see mostly that they are cert I mean, some kind of um, in discussion of, uh, let me just put it in this way, they're just um, rephrasing the situation in some kind of uh, two-edged uh, question. So uh, we see that from the Ottoman point of view or from the modern Turkish point of view, it was kind of a scholarly acquisition uh, from the uh, Egypt or from any else uh, in, the, in that period, uh, however, on the other hand, let's say uh, from the uh, Egyptian or from the um, Arabist point of view, that was kind of an example of the Ottoman uh, colonialistic politi policies in the region. Uh, because uh, most of the scholars are now, especially in the late period, are, are referring to that um, process as part of stealing the wealth or stealing the heritage of the uh, locals to Istanbul. So uh, this paper is not aiming actually uh, putting all these questions in a political sense, but rather take it as a historical phenomenon and just try to concentrate on these Egyptian scholars uh, within the frame of their role or their contributions in the Ottoman intellectual life. So uh, I just wanted to talk on two different cases. One of them is uh, the question of what happened to these uh, Egyptian exiles in Istanbul. I'm going to start with this question, and then I'm going to go to the case studies uh, because, I mean, we see quite a lot of people, prominent uh, figures, leaders, family members, uh, scholars and historians who were taken to Istanbul at that point, uh, at that specific point. So, um, 
When you talk to any historian of science, of course, they're going to list you a long list of the transfer of knowledge. They're going to tell you the political encounters, they're going to tell you the social interactions between the cultures are the main reasons for the transfer of knowledge. And then we see that at that point, of, I mean, that specific period, actually, the wars uh, were among these uh, main reasons how the transfer of knowledge taken place uh, in Ottoman world and in, uh, well, let's say in the Ottoman world. Similar cases can be seen starting from the Alexander the Great, as we all know. He went to the East and took uh, many um, goods from the East and then it somehow helped to generate the Hellenistic culture. However, in the late period, in, for example, in 15th century, we see that similar actions were taken by other Conquerors like uh, Professor Tezjan, for example, just mentioned a couple of scholars who were taken to, uh, to Samarkand with uh, Timur, for example. They were regarded as one of the uh, sources for kind of a change, for kind of a development in uh, their own cultural heritage, maybe. But in um, Selim's practice, it was a little bit, it was a little bit similar and it was also a little bit different uh, because we see that the same thing, same practice happened in Tabriz before the conquest of Egypt. Uh, in Tabriz, uh, certainly uh, the Ottomans faced with uh, many developments in, especially in the arts and that they took several people, artisans and uh, certainly uh, ulema with them uh, to Istanbul, and that became somehow a part of, uh, so they, they explained somehow the development of the uh, Ottoman uh, Turkish arts, especially in the field of miniature. So, uh, but we see also in this period, um, especially in this specific case, uh, Selim I, for example, took some ulema, among them uh, Kadızade Zahiruddin, Erdebile, who will be involved in Ahmed Pasha's case in Egypt later on. And uh, he's going to be a very, uh, imp not important, but he, he's going to be a very uh, famous figure in this revolt. But how is the Egyptian case? That is certainly our question. And we know that this, uh, Selim I, after uh, settle down all the situation in Cairo, we know that actually the, conf uh, the conflicts and the violent clashes between the, uh, be, I mean, between the locals and the uh, Ottomans were just continuously uh, affecting the people. And after the set all settlement had just established, uh, just, uh, or the Cairo was settled, uh, Selim I commenced on certainly implementing his policies, especially in administrative point of view. And uh, among these policies, uh, exiling prominent figures were uh, one of the most uh, important measures, uh, measures Selim I took at that point. Um, so the preparation period for the exile started a little bit uh, late, let's say uh, April 14th, uh, 1517. Uh, According to the historical data, uh, actually Kadazade. Uh, Excuse me, uh, Zeyrek Zade and uh, Mehmet Pasha was involved with the selection of the exiles, and then the sh shipping of the exiles started on July 15, uh, 50, uh, July 15, uh, 15th of July, 1517. That was a very long period. Uh, that was a long process, let's say, because, I mean, we see that the shipping didn't occur in just very specific moments, but uh, they started to ship people uh, by one by or group by group uh, in the period of time. So the question is that who were they really? What were the reasons for sending them to Istanbul? How did their exile end? And how they, did they do during the exile? So uh, what we see is actually uh, when it comes to their, um, comes to their profile, uh, Sultan uh, Selim I didn't actually took only the ulema of it, but also took many artisans, craftsmen, cadis, for example, officials at the court, notable people, notables, uh, merchants, some groups from Cairo, uh, Cairo Christians and Jews. The thing is that uh, it's easy for today uh, to get some kind of a list, thanks to Ibn Ayaz, for sure. Uh, for example, this actually slide shows you list of the cadis in exile. You can see that actually, um, there is a long list, however, um, 
because of uh, the reason that he was using nicknames, most probably, you see that Shamsettin, for example, Kemalatin, these are the uh, nicknames or epithets you, you may call it. It's very hard to define, actually, who they were. On the other hand, uh, when you look at the uh, when you look at autobiographical uh, sources, you can still say that uh, there were some specific people uh, who were also inside this exile process. So, uh, what was it actually? What were the reasons for sending them uh, to Istanbul? It depends on the group, obviously. When it comes to the prominent figures, it was certainly kind of a security measure. That was sure because he was uh, anxious that uh, they would stay there and just cause kind of a disorder in uh, Cairo. And certainly there were some practical reasons like building his own establishments in Istanbul and then he faced uh, good handy people who were very much talented in uh, their own works. So this is why actually we, we can say that some practical reasons were also on the scene. Ibn Iyaz strangely says that uh, the Ottoman settlement policy was actually one of the reasons. We know that Ottomans were just set, uh, they had their own policy for settlements. They were just relocating people. For example, when they went to the Balkans, they, uh, they took several uh, groups from Anatolia, to re uh, settled them there, and then they also uh, moved some local people uh, to Istanbul or to, uh, or to some places around Anatolia. These are obvious reasons for sure, but on the other hand, some scholars say that that might be also kind of an economical consideration involved in the process because uh, Selim I was uh, expecting that the trade the rules would be changed and the Portuguese were uh, very much in the lead of this change. So he took mer uh, some merchants, some tradesmen with to Istanbul so that he could make the port, Istanbul port, uh, an important place for the future trade uh, intersections. And of course, scholarly ambitions were also involved. involved. Uh, Selim I wanted to have uh, some ulema with so that the discourse in the academic discourse or scholarly discourse in the Ottoman uh, cultural zone would just be developed in this regard. So how did their exile end? I think this is the most important question. They returned for sure. They didn't return like all together in a couple of years. They returned starting from uh, actually uh, 1521 uh, or something and then it's just continued until the end uh, of the return actually the the, the last return was al mutawakkil's return the, the caliph was also inside the exile list so when he returned uh, we can say that the over was the issuance of a, an official permission from the sultan uh, sulaiman the first that we are going to talk about it later. So, the question, what did they do in the exile, really? These are war case studies. Uh, I just went through uh, most of the historical resources. However, it's, it's very hard to uh, find exact names. However, I was able to find four scholars that might be interesting for you. One of them is not a scholar, scholar, but he's the most, I think, important figure in this period, the caliph, what happened to the caliph? Did he die in Istanbul? How was his relation with the sultan was among the most important questions that the modern scholarship is, actually is still one of the most important questions that the modern scholarship is posing. The second one is a family. Maybe you have heard about them, Qaisunis, Qusunis, maybe you can call them. Uh, and then he, they are uh, very, they became like the chief of the physicians of the court. They were also in the exile list. Another one, Ibn al-Naqib, uh, he was actually the teacher of the uh, Sultan Gavri's son. He was taken as a prisoner. Uh, during the marriage of book, and he was taken to Istanbul uh, among the, the, the other exiles. An historian we have, uh, that's Abdul Rahim, uh, as my professor, <laughs> Abdul Rahim al Abbasi. There are some rumors about his life, actually, uh, that we are going to say. So, the first one, the, the 
the one, let's say, the last caliph, uh, he became the caliph in 1508, uh, I'm sorry, and the historical sources are actually depicting him in very different ways. In one point, he goes unwillingly to Aleppo with Sultan Gauri. Sultan Gauri says that, okay, you're going to come with me to Aleppo. Uh, he doesn't pay any penny to him. He has to uh, afford his own, uh, I mean, outcomes, and then, but he goes. Then he becomes, uh, becomes prisoner. He, he was captured during the Marja Dabak with other four Qadis, actually. And then uh, he returns back to Cairo with the Ottoman army. Uh, and then he turns out to be a mediator between the locals and the Sultan. And then it's certainly when, while he was enjoying uh, basically the wealth of the people in Cairo, he became somehow more important in the eyes of the Sultan. But then something happened, their relationship got a little bit bad, and then he turned out to become one of these uh, exiles, uh, exiles in Istanbul. So the Sultan took him, uh, take, uh, took him to Istanbul. The same thing happens, the history goes in the same direction, in the beginning, he becomes very important in the eyes of the uh, Ottoman scholars, maybe. But then he starts enjoying the taste of this life. And he ends up in the prison, Yedikule Zindanlere, which is pretty famous. But it's very interesting because Ibn Ayaz talks about the Yedikule Zindanlere, seven tower dungeons, as uh, is a place which is in eight days in that distance. So it's not, it can't be possible. So we should be a little bit, uh, we should be very much careful about reading this text. However, we know that according to the historical data from the Ottoman side, we also know that he was in the dungeons for some times until uh, Sultan Suleiman rescued him, not rescuing, but uh, granting him his permission to come back to the court, and then he returns back to, uh, to Cairo at a certain point of time. So what he did in Istanbul, it's, it's a question, certainly it's an open question. What we know is that he certainly enjoyed his life. The strange thing is that in Ottoman um, historical data, we don't uh, know the details of his life. But we know from the Arabic resources that he got involved kind of a conflict with his cousins. The cousins were also uh, with him in Istanbul, Abu Bakr and Ahmed, and they certainly had some kind of an uh, idea that they should be uh, the ones following the caliph. And they were complaining constantly. Uh, they were filing constantly com uh, complaints to the sultan and the viziers about the situation. They were very much uh, discomfy about the situation that they were not paid well, and the caliph was taking their share also. So the when it just ended to the lifestyle of the caliph in Istanbul, certainly what happened is that he just dis, uh, he was just disregarded, uh, dis, uh, granted, let's say. So the other occasion Ibn Yas was mentioning is that prominent figures were about to escape uh, back to their town, back to Cairo. So uh, caliph's possible escape would just steer the intent, uh, the steer the interest of the sultan. So he kept him in the dungeons for uh, several years, not one or two. I think it was like five years that he stayed in the dungeons and that he continued to enjoy his life there. Then he was released by the order of Suleiman the first. This is interesting. He was granted uh, 60 dirham per diem. The dirham in this point of time, I think it was like 12 akcha. So it's, it was not a small amount of money actually. And then he was paid for his residence. He was paid for his other tastes let's say, and then he returned back to Egypt in 1524. And then we were talking about this with the professors, whether he was involved in the Ahmed Pasha's revolt in Egypt is still an open question, but the thing is that the Arbekri, 
mentions his uh, manuscript, uh, it's like an addendum to uh, Ibn Iyas' work, he mentions that he returned in the, uh, he, he returned during the January of 15. Uh, 24, but um, he mentions on an, another uh, occasion that actually uh, Ahmed Pasha was blessed by a caliph. Uh, sorry, the other way around. I mean, um, in the beginning, the Arabic he mentions that he was blessed, Ahmed Pasha was blessed the, uh, by the caliph, so the caliph should be there. But on the other hand, on another occasion, he says that he returns on the beginning of December. So it's not possible that he was in Istanbul, he was sending his blessings to the uh, Ahmed Pasha, uh, and then something happened. It's not that much possible. So most probably there was another kind of a caliph named maybe as caliph or not, we don't know, but uh, he was not that much certain, uh, it's not that much certain that he was involved that much into the uh, revolt. So he dies uh, in 1543, um, we, don't, we don't know the details, nobody mentions about him anymore, uh, and then he disappears from the whole historical data. The second case is Kaisunis. Kaisunis, um, actually Shebsetim Muhammad Kaisuni. He was the chief of the physicians in Sultan Gauri's court, that's for sure. He was also in Marjitabak. So that's interesting because um, the caliph was in Marjitabak with four cadets, all right? This one, Kaisuni, was also in Marjidabuk, and we will see that the, le I mean, the, other, uh, the other case is also involved in Marjidabuk. So it's a little bit it's interesting uh, to see all three of them were involved in this uh, war. So, and they were taken as prisoners during the war, and they were sent to Istanbul afterwards. This one, uh, Shemsettin Kaisuni, lived in Istanbul until the death of S Selim I, for sure. He is the one actually responsible for all the information we have now because he was constantly sending letters to his relatives in Cairo. So he was gossiping, he was saying that this guy was doing this and the, uh, for example, the caliph is dealing with this problem. So. He was just the, he is just like the main uh, source for all the events that took place in Istanbul. He returns back and he dies in Rosetta in 1524. And well, his story ends at this point. However, his son, Bedrettin, who didn't uh, go to uh, Istanbul by the occasion of the exile, he was, uh, asked for his uh, leave to Istanbul afterwards to become a court physician. And he is also an interesting figure. Uh, this is uh, Zelheim's uh, prominent work, let's say. This shows all the family line of Kaisunis. Uh, Kaisunis. And Bedrettin is actually, I think he's one of the most famous ones because uh, Atayi mentions him as a great deal. He was in Sgetmarsh and he was the one who was assigned to embalm the body of the Sultan Suleiman. So he became quite prominent and then he was in Thai relationship with the court for sure. Then uh, he and his sons, his offsprings, let's say, stayed in Istanbul for a very long period of time, and they contributed to somehow the Ottoman literature that uh, we are still following, uh, we can still find some available sources from this family in the manuscript libraries in Istanbul. Uh, the interesting thing also related to Kaisuni that I should just mention, Kaisuni was not actually exiled because of because of that he was a good scholar or something, because Atayi specifically mentions that he was close to the court of Sultan Gavri and he was a good, um, talented man. So that was something else. He was not a scholar, he was not regarded as a scholar when he went to the exile. He was in the list of the talent, talented men. So that's a little bit tricky. Because, I mean, afterwards we will see that he is going to continue to show his talents in the court. So, Garsaddin Halil bin 
Al Naqib is another story. He is uh, he studied in Aleppo, Damascus, medicine, astronomy, in Cairo. He came to Cairo by walking. Actually, this is what the resources says. He came to Cairo by walking. It mentions very uh, many times that he was walking all the time. Maybe he was a part of Mashais. Anyway, uh, he became very famous in Cairo uh, and appointed as the teacher, as a teacher actually, for Gavri's son. He was also in Marjadabak. So uh, he was also, I mean, part of the campaign of Sultan Gavri in uh, taken as a prisoner again and sent to Istanbul. He was offered many times official posts. He refused. He, he made his life, uh, I mean, he afforded his life by giving some private classes, according to the uh, biographers. And then uh, he returned back to Damascus. He comes and goes back uh, between, I mean, his travels are like uh, go, coming here, going back to Damascus, going to Egypt. It's just like a whole route is very interesting to see. But he's, mo I mean, it's interesting that he was not dealing with the religious studies actually. He was working on astronomy and mat uh, mathematics. He was, and he was regarded as uh, one of the uh, inventors of the astronomical equipments in, in uh, Ottoman circles. This is his uh, manuscript, uh, not his manuscript, of course, it's just a copy. However, uh, it's his Risale on sign calculations. Uh, that period of time, there was a huge discussion among the scholars about the calculations of sign. So uh, he took his part for commenting on the Castellani's uh, perception of sign. And then he wrote a Risale. You can, it's available in the Suleimania library. And he goes uh, with, um, I'm just finishing. He goes with these calculations in another work. You can also see that you, uh, here. This is the first page. He gives some names afterwards, he gives some terminology afterwards, which is very interesting uh, Risale actually in this regard. The last one, Abdurrahim al Abbas. He, he was born in Cairo. He traveled to Istanbul two times. He's a special case. He was, uh, we are not sure whether he was in the list of exiles. He went to Istanbul for the first time uh, by the order of Sultan Gavri in a, con in a kind of accompany to a special envoy. Then he found a chance at that point uh, to present his commentary on Bukhari to Bayezid II. This is that one. This is the original. I mean, this is his copy, actually. He presented it. He was offered uh, to take a position in where, which is very interesting, uh, in the madrasa of the sultan, the sultan's own madrasa. So Bezat II, uh, the madrasa of uh, Bezat II is famous. Uh, most of us know it because mostly Sheikh al Islams were teaching at this specific madrasa. So he refused that. We're not sure whether he was uh, offered for such kind of uh, offered such kind of a position, but the thing is that um, he, I mean, he refuses this offer, and then he goes back. After Atai says that, uh, after he stayed there, he decided to come to Istanbul because Gavri's uh, administration was collapsed. We don't know whether he was in exile or he was basically he preferred to go to Istanbul by his own will, um, but then he made his life in Istanbul. He settled down. Strangely enough, he participated in the Rhodes campaign, and he wrote uh, an interesting history about the campaign there. And then uh, his works on religious studies especially continued, and they are certainly available as it is in the uh, manuscript libraries of Istanbul. These are four cases that I wanted to present to you. Different cases for sure. Uh, one of them is the most important person of the year, uh, that period for sure. But um, the other ones are relatively scholarly figures. 
However, uh, their impact on the cultural zone is still in question for us now. So we know actually the links with the Egyptian scholars uh, had long been established. Many Ottoman scholars came to Cairo to, to be educated here, returned back. This is very normal because you are luck. Uh, I mean, uh, at this point you need human resources, let's put it in a contemporary context. And then certainly most uh, important uh, scholarly circles were around, were uh, in Egypt, in Tabriz, and then that's very normal that Ottoman scholars were going there and taking their education. However, we see that in the, during this campaign, there is one special character actually in the city of Cairo, Gülşeni, uh, Said Gülş uh, sorry, Ibrahim Gülşeni, who is a sheikh, Halveti sheikh, he was located in Cairo at that period, and Selim visited him, he, he paid a visit to him. He didn't ask him to go to Istanbul. He rather said, you stay here. But afterwards, after the uh, Ahmed Pasha's revolt, we know that Ibrahim Pasha came here and saw that he became kind of a figure for the Cairo. And then he was a little bit anxious about his uh, doings here. So what, what happened that he took him with, he didn't, took, he didn't take him with, but he asked the Sultan to uh, send him an order to go to Istanbul and uh, present himself in, in front of the Sultan and just tell us about the real story, what happened, to, what, what he's doing in Cairo. This is another story. So he stay, I mean, he makes, uh, he lets people to stay in Egypt. He didn't take all of uh, ulema or something. Then, Scholars, we see that among the list, scholars are just very limited in numbers. Most of them, as I told you before, most of them were the prominent figures, or the, or the political figures. So it's very hard to make a generalization, whether he took them specifically for that reason. And then we have to maybe pose the question, there is certainly a change in the uh, academic uh, discourse in Ottoman in Ottomans at that period. We see that uh, actually in the juridical discussions there are so many radical points. Points they were introduced by that time, and according to some scholars today, uh, they were the main reason for this kind of introduction was actually coming from the Arab world, coming from the uh, the conquest, uh, the exile list of the conquest. Uh, so, Egyptian scholars' impact on the religious studies are just very much limited in this regard. However, we should say that we are just talking about the exiles, not exactly the people who preferred to stay in Istanbul, who went to Istanbul. So, uh, these are two different phenomena. Not exactly the exiles were just uh, doing that on purpose, but uh, most, probably, uh, most probably the ones who wanted to go to Istanbul later on, for some reasons, uh, Professor Tezjan said that this kind of a complication relationship in the political sense were very much on the scene. So we don't know it for sure yet. So how we are going to cl classify, I mean, qualify basically the Sultan's role in this all thing. Whether he was a patron or, I mean, uh, just, granting some, I don't know, benevolence, some money to the ulema who is just supporting them, or who is just uh, a pragmatist, who is just a pragmatist, who just wanted to take whatever he saw. This is still an open question for us, but we see that all these four cases are just representing uh, different parts of this whole story, and then we know that these complications are very much on the, uh, very much on the road for the future uh, academic works. Thank you very much for your patience. This is what I want to present. Thank you, Dr. Farad. Our third speaker is uh, Dr. Himmat uh, Tashkomor from Harvard University. His title is uh, Law and Politics in 16th Century Damascus. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tashkomor to AUB. <laughs> the 
this is, you know, the shows that <laughs> affect of the, the jet lag that I saw uh, the Beirut and immediately thought that it is uh, the mine. Um, thank you very much, uh, the Professor Orfale, for uh, the kind introduction. And actually, I uh, slightly changed my uh, the title, uh, which uh, is uh, different from uh, the, um, uh, the the one uh, in the program that is law and lawmaking in the 16th century Ottoman Bilad uh the law and uh, the lawmaking in the 16th century Ottoman uh, the Bilad Sham. This apparatus is very limiting for me, and I'm not. Uh, used to uh, giving uh, the speeches in sitting, uh, the, but I will try my uh, the best. I can't, can I, you know, the, you know, otherwise I will be in terrible. Uh, Thank you very much. Well, uh, uh, then I will uh, deal with uh, PowerPoint uh, the, after the end of, uh, the, or you may uh, the later on. Uh, thank you very much, and I would like to also uh, start uh, by thanking uh, organizers of the, uh, the conference, particularly to Professor uh, the Abu Hussein and Mehmed Ali Nezi, who kindly invited me to attend the conference and facilitated its uh, realization. As many years, I also, I think, accumulated great debt uh, the, to uh, the many professors uh, the, who works on uh, the Ottoman history uh, with a focus on uh, the, uh, the Arab, profers, uh, Arab pro uh, provinces, such as uh, the Neli Hanna, uh, the uh, Professor Abu Hussein, uh, Abdul Karim Rafik, whom I uh, the, uh, the of uh, the great deal and I acknowledge uh, their kind help and uh, instructions uh, the, over the years. I truly appreciate. And also remember Halil Sahil Loolo uh, the, from Istanbul. Uh, he passed away. Rahmetullahi alayhi rahmeten wasi'aten. The issue that I will be speaking about law and lawmaking, it is particularly the issue of the, uh, the formation of the Ottoman Kanunname, or you know, how Ottomans uh, the codified uh, the, the laws, uh, the starting from uh, the, uh, the early, uh, the first quarter of the 16th uh, the century. Um, in uh, the Bilad Sham, excluding the Egypt that is, you know, requiring a, uh, the much uh, the different study that I can uh, the do, um, and along with uh, the this kanuname uh, or lawmaking uh, the process, and uh, the other uh, the local reactions and also uh, uh, Arabization or translations of the, the kanuname into uh, the uh, the Arabic uh, the language. Um, Unfortunately, none of the, the Ottoman Kanunames, to the best of my, my knowledge, that is very much based upon the, the Turkish uh, the scholarship and uh, the European scholarship, uh, the scholarly edited uh, the, uh, and published, uh, there is a publication of Ahmed Akkündüz, uh, a colleague, um, published uh, Kanunames uh, the, of the, uh, the 16th century. But many of them are, you know, they're excluding the Arabic, uh, the preambles, and often uh, they're not much uh, the analysis uh, the, of the uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the text that uh, we have archival sources. Um, my study primarily based upon the existing uh, the Kanun Ames and also a unique uh, Mezalim register uh, the from. Uh, the uh, 965, uh, the 15, uh, the 40, uh, compiled by Ahmed bin uh, Hassan es Samsuni, uh, who was uh, appointed as an inspector um, uh, to uh, uh, to go over uh, the Sinan Pasha's uh, the Sinan Pasha, the Beylerbey of uh, the Sham, 
and number of the Subashas, uh, the officers of the law and order in Damascus, uh, the, um, and the cases, legal cases, uh, the pertaining to uh, their uh, the malpractices and uh, certain issues regarding the application of uh, the Ottoman, uh, the Kanun Names in the region. And the third is uh, the translation of the Sham Kanun Namesi, uh, the law code, in uh, the late 16th century by uh, the Aleppun uh, the scholars, Ibn Bilal, uh, Baki Bey, uh, they previously talked about uh, existence or non-existence of uh, the, the Arab scholars uh, the, in the, uh, the legal hierarchy. And Ibn Bilal apparently, uh, the, the, all the information comes from his own uh, the testimonies in the introduction of his uh, the legal pamphlets that he uh, the, uh, the compiled was uh, the serving uh, the under uh, the Sheikhul Islamate of uh, Abu Sud Efendi, famous uh, the 16th century Ottoman uh, the scholar. Many of the uh, the pamphlets, legal uh, the pamphlets he uh, the wrote in Istanbul. He clearly uh, the declares and acknowledges that the works that he uh, the wrote. Uh, as a service to uh, the Abu Sud Efendi, uh, which originated uh, the, from a number of uh, the legal uh, the cases. The, the Ibn Bilal's uh, the translation of uh, the Kanun Name is previously published by a Tunisian uh, the colleague and scholar Abdul Majid Shaban in 2001 in Mejellet al Tarihi al Arabiya li Dirasat al Uthmaniya. And I found another copy in Istanbul, which very much overlaps, you know, the, with minor uh, the, uh, the differences uh, in in these two uh, the, uh, the copies. But when we uh, the talk about uh, the uh, the lawmaking, you know, the, in Bilad Sham and uh, the, uh, particularly uh, the post-conquest era, uh, the first issue comes to my mind is. Uh, problematization of the, uh, the, the notion of the, the Ottoman conquest, you know, the hand, how ideologically and legally uh, uh, the Ottoman conquest uh, was conceptualized uh, the, by the Ottomans in uh, the early 16th century. As uh, the, the Ottoman sources, uh, they refer uh, the Ottoman uh, the conquest as Fethi Haqqani, uh, or Arabic al Fethil Haqqani, uh, the, uh, as opposed to or to distinguish from the uh, the, uh, the Fethi Islami, i.e., you know, the opening up a land that uh, there was not uh, the previously under uh, the Muslim uh, dominion. Therefore, this is a sort of an an imperial conquest, uh, the, but not necessarily, you know, the conquest in an in an Islamic sense. And there are certain. Uh, the political uh, the ramifications of, of, of this uh, the, uh, the concept, which we may you know the deal with uh, in uh, the questions and answers uh, the section, and I will not uh, go much uh, into. But uh, for the uh, the purposes of my own talk, this uh, the uh, the 1516 or 1517, you know the Aleppo, uh, the uh, Damascus and then all uh, the Kyrian, uh, the takeover by the, the Ottomans, is, uh, is a watershed at uh, the moment. It's, you know, the critical uh, the event in history, but it is not the, the, uh, the beginning of everything in a true sense. It, this is, there is an, a process, the, the gradual, gradual process of uh, the transition uh, the, um, from the Memluk rule to the, to the Ottoman. And in this process, and, um, it becomes uh, the quite uh, the crucial that um, um, what we call this, the, the lawmaking is very much, you know, the heavily relies on the existing, the, uh, the legal, uh, existing the Memluk, uh, the legal practices, you know, the, um, um, one issue uh, the here I would also um, like to uh, the highlight um, is when we talk about the, uh, the territories uh, the, that uh, were incorporated by Ottomans and the Kanun Names uh, that were drafted is much larger territories than the existing Bilad Sham, i.e., you know, the, 
the areas of the southeastern Anatolia and also southeastern Mediterranean region, uh, which were uh, the, uh, somehow the vassal, uh, the Beylikate or Emirates, uh, the, uh, like the Ramazanoğlu and Dulkadiroğlu, uh, the Feridun Bey, uh, the, uh, they talked about them uh, the yesterday. And these were, and also under uh, the somehow uh, the Memluk or the, uh, the legal uh, the system, which uh, the, uh, was incorporated into uh, the, uh, the Ottoman uh, the system. Yeah, the. So um, the, the earliest uh, the codification, you know, the, and I'm using to codification in a very uh, the light sense, uh, the, not in a very strict uh, the legal sense of the, the term, um, of uh, the lawmaking, kanunname making uh, of the Ottomans is roughly uh, the 1524 onwards. So there is and really a gap between 1517 to 1524, uh, you know, the, um, we have some uh, the testimonies uh, such as uh, the Abdul Samet at uh, Diyarbakir, uh, Hanım, they mentioned uh, the of him as to uh, the how Ottomans uh, really uh, ruled over, you know, the post, you know, the, uh, the conquest, uh, the era is very much is relying, you know, the existing uh, the Memluk uh, the practices, uh, the, which over time uh, the, uh, the Ottomans uh, either uh, the amended uh, or uh, the fully, you know, the reappropriated into uh, the, their own uh, the, uh, the legal uh, the, uh, the, the, the structure. And for example, uh, in the, uh, the the areas of Adana and uh, the Sis, uh, the 1524, uh, the Kanun Name, uh, they mentions that, uh, that this is a very much of a reworking of the Kayit by uh, the, uh, the Kanun Names. Uh, the, uh, and both of the Kanun Name, both Adana and Sis are you know, the identical, almost, you know, the verbatim, uh, the, uh, the copies of uh, the, uh, the each uh, other. But uh, the the kanun names that are uh, the more, you know, the, the Aleppo, uh, uh, the, uh, the Damascus, and uh, the many other uh, the cities in the region uh, clearly indicates that uh, the Ottomans uh, the abolished some of the, the Memluk uh, the practices. When it is an, uh, the full adaptation of the, the, uh, the Memluk code, it is, you know, they mentioned which kanun or the, which sultan's kanun they are talking about, like the kayıt by kanunları. But uh, when it is uh, the referred in a very generic sense is Cherakise, you know, the, it's, you know, the Cherkessians uh, the, to distinguish uh, the, uh, uh, the their state from the, the Memluk uh, the state, uh, the two. And referring to uh, abolishment of uh, the certain bid'ats, uh, the Çerakise zamanından bazı bid'atlerin uh, the kaldırılması, uh, ref'i, I'm sorry, but doesn't really, you know, the clearly, you know, articulate what were those, you know, the bid'ats that, you know, the Ottomans are uh, the abolishing, you know, the, and I really don't have much clear uh, the answer, uh, the, uh, as to uh, these abolishments are uh, there. The kanunames of uh, the, uh, uh, the Bilad-ı Şam, uh, the over time, you know, the they amended and changed. They are not, you know, the, uh, they remain uh, the static. And during this uh, the process, it seems that there is an also negotiation between the, uh, the, uh, the population uh, the, uh, the of the region with the, the Ottoman uh, the, uh, surveyors and uh, the kanun, uh, the makers. Uh, the, for example, uh, in the uh, the Sham Kanun Namesi, uh, it mentions that uh, um, and after uh, the abolishment of uh, uh, certain uh, the Memluk uh, the practices, 
the Ottomans, uh, the levy that uh, the, a married person should pay uh, 140 uh, the Aleppo coin, uh, the, and uh, the unmarried uh, the person uh, the should pay uh, the nothing. And then they say that the Kanun Nama states that uh, the people came and complained that this is uh, a law that they cannot really, you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, abide with and they cannot really uh, the meet its uh, the, uh, the demands and ask for uh, the, uh, the emendations of uh, the, the Kanun Nama. Uh, the, Um, so, uh, the, uh, the, regarding the question of the, the legal actors uh, the, in, uh, in this uh, the process, uh, the, and of course the Rumi scholars, you know, the, probably you know, the, these people, you know, in the Kanun Names, their names are uh, they mentioned. Some of them are Rumis, clearly, uh, the, from uh, the Istanbul or uh, the other Anatolian uh, the places. But uh, the, also, uh, the looks like that they are very much uh, the worked in collaboration with uh, the local scholars in drafting uh, these uh, the kanunames. Uh, the, uh, the, um, so this is an, a very much you know the uh, a dialogic uh, the process is not just you know the uh, the demands of the, the Istanbul or you know the centers or you know the Ottoman uh, the administration. But it's very much, you know, the uh, the working together to uh, the uh, the find a, a workable, a workable legal, legal procedures. You know, the not necessarily uh, a codified, you know, the legal uh, the articles uh, the at hand. Uh, the. So, uh, the, and Baki Bey already uh, mentioned about you know the uh, the control of uh, the top judiciary of uh, the the Bilad Sham Arab provinces uh, by the Rumi, uh, the judges and scholars. But at the same time, you know, there is another, uh, the strong current was uh, the taking place that uh, the Niyabets, you know, the more uh, the delegate positions are primarily controlled by the, uh, the scholars uh, the, from the, uh, the region. That is uh, the, and very significant uh, the bearing on the Ottoman, uh, the, uh, the legal institutions uh, the, in, in the Bilad Sham. And I know very closely the Jerusalem case, for example, uh, 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 the where um, Khalidi family, uh, whose descendants are still, you know, the, uh, exist today, uh, uh, clearly controlled for about like 300 years, uh, the, uh, the, not only Niyabets in the provinces, but also uh, the chief clerkship, uh, the Bashkatib, uh, the ship of the the, uh, the Mahkeme, uh, the in Jerusalem and the in the uh, the adjacent uh, the areas. Uh, the. Uh, the in 16th century, you know the uh, the of course you know the Cairo always you know loomed large in Ottoman uh, the scholarly uh, the concerns and world, but uh, the. Post-conquest, you know, the Ottoman world and Ottoman administration and scholarly world turned to the Kairian and particularly Memluk uh, the scholarship uh, from a different uh, the perspective. And I think this is a very significant uh, the development. Um, in 15th century, Cairo was very much a center of learning where, you know, the, uh, the Students from an Anatolian stock, you know, they traveled to get uh, the education, and many of them also rose to prominent positions like Ekmeleddin Baberti, uh, the Kemaleddin Ibn Humam, uh, Muhyiddin Kafiyeci, you know, the significant towering Hanifi figures of, of this period. But their impact uh, in their uh, the, uh, the place of origin was rather limited, you know. The, uh, with the exception of Muhyiddin Kafiyeci, for example, I haven't seen any works of Ekmeleddin Baberti, who wrote a, a major commentary on El Hidaya, as being copied and read, you know, the, in Istanbul before the 1520s. You know, the, this is a really a post uh, the, uh, the conquest of uh, the development uh, the, in the 
uh, the Hanifi uh, the scholarship. I am a little bit arguing against also uh, our dear uh, the colleague uh, Guy Burak, uh, the two in that sense. Uh, this turning to the Memluk Hanefi, uh, the scholarship has then also practical aspect too. You know, the, like the Makrizi, uh, the, and whose manuscripts and autographs were uh, the brought to the Cairo. Not only the Arabic texts uh, were brought to the, uh, the Cairo, they were also translated into uh, the Ottoman Turkish for the practical uh, the purposes. We do have uh, the translations of uh, the Makrizi's, uh, the Khitat, and number of uh, the uh, the other uh, the legal texts like the Tarsusi's Tuhvet uh, Turk Fima Yejib and Yu'mele Fil Mulk, a book uh, that uh, the argues uh, the, for the legitimacy of the the, uh, the Turkic Memluk uh, the uh, the rulership uh, in Cairo. That is, you know, the translated into uh, the Ottoman Turkish, and of course this. Early, you know, the Memluk, you know, the dynasty, the Turkic, uh, the dynasty, now uh, they very much apply that the Ottoman case, you know, and their, uh, the rulership and its uh, the legitimacy in the, uh, the, uh, the in the, uh, in the region. Uh, the. And Baki Bey already they, they mentioned uh, the Ibrahim Halebi, uh, the Multakal Epsur, but uh, the uh, Ibrahim Halebi and figures like him are not an isolated uh, the, uh, the, uh, the figures. You know, the, again, uh, starting with the, uh, the mid 16th century onwards, we will see uh, the, the scholars from uh, the, the region, and including the Shami scholars, uh, the writing and incorporating Ottoman uh, the Hanafis into uh, the larger tabakat uh, the, uh, the works. Uh, the, and in this uh, context, I would like to mention uh, the Shemseddin Ahmed ibn Tulun's uh, uh, a major uh, the work, al Ghuraf Al-Aliyya fi Tarajimi Mutaakhir al Hanafiya, a major uh, the tabakat uh, the work, uh, which to this date uh, the remains uh, the unpublished as an, uh, the manuscript. Uh, and also, Taqiyid Din al Tamimi work, Tabakat al Siniyya fi Tarajim al Hanafiyya, and also uh, the uh, Shemsetin Ahmed ibn Tulun's Surul Basham fi Qudat al Dimashq al Sham, which is very much, you know, the, the, the uh, narrates a narrative of a smooth transition of the, the judiciary from the Memluk to the Ottoman, uh, which uh, Professor Abu Hussein mentioned, the Ibn Farfur, uh, the family, and uh, the, their role uh, the, in uh, the Demesine, uh, the legal uh, the, the system. Uh, the. All right, uh, the, I'm uh, the Tentatively, uh, the concluding that the, uh, the lawmaking process in the 16th century Bilad Sham was a dialogic process. In this dialogic process, the law codes, the kanunames of the Arab eyalets, should be treated as legal codes, not in the strict sense of the codification, rather as regulative guidelines and principles whose articles owed great deal to the existing Memluk, uh, the law codes. Furthermore, law codes were further amended and gradually Ottoman regime established itself as the primary lawmaking uh, the institution, yet the arena of law was open for negotiations between the practitioners of law and the society to whom these laws uh, were applied. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And
Uh, the close the there are, you know, the uh, continuations, but also, you know, the differences uh, the, between, you know, the each uh, the rearticulation. Uh, the this is the the title page of the register of the Teftish. Uh, the uh, it is in Ottoman Turkish. Emri Sherif. Uh, Emri Şerifi Cihan Muta, Muta Muktezası'nca sabıka Şan Beyler Beyisi olan Emirül Ümera ile Kiram Sinan Paşa'nın ve su başlarının mehayif ve mezalimi bir hasebi şer i şerif görülüp üzerlerine zahir olan kazaya defteridir. This is an 200 page uh, the, uh, the register uh, the, uh, which very much you know the uh, oversees the legal case brought against the, the malpractices of Sinan Pasha and Subashi, uh, the law and order uh, the officers uh, the, from this uh, the time period. Uh, this is uh, the one settlement case uh, I typed uh, in Arabic, and I will read. Saleh Ali ibn Khalil min qariyeti Danistan, the Tabi Gunayra ma'a Dawud bin Abdullah, amma idda'ahu وهو مبلغ خمسة وعشرين سلطانيا سلطاني إذن الماني الذي أخذ منه بغير حق وهو صالح معه على مبلغ إثنى سلطاني وخمس قطع مقبوزة مصالحة صحيحة قاطعة للنزاع ورافعة للخصومة ثم أبرأ كل واحد منهما زمة الآخر عن جميع الدعاوي والمطالبات عموما وخصوصا the cases that are, you know, the, uh, the related to the, uh, the sulh, the settlements, are predominantly recorded in Arabic, uh, are very much, you know, the, in this, uh, the similar. But uh, the cases uh, the, that related to other, uh, the administrative, uh, the malpractices were predominantly uh, in, in, in Turkish. And... I have just one page to show how it uh, the, uh, the looks like. This is part of the, the page. Thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Tashkomor, and I would like to invite all the speakers actually to take their questions. And we have roughly half an hour for questions. My uh, question or comment is for uh, Baki. Of course, I found this uh, paper very, very interesting, and it puts things in place. In a way, it tells us what we know, that there were, uh, there's not much uh, scholarly exchange uh, at the high level. Uh, but I just wanted to point out, I believe that there is a big difference between scholarly exchanges uh, in Syria than, and in Egypt. As far as I know, th in the period of 300 years of Ottoman presence in Egypt, there was one Qadi Quda who was uh, from here, and that was uh, Ahmed Khafegi. No more, no less. Uh, I believe in Syria, the exchange was easy. Of course, proximity is an issue. They're very close. There is a, maybe a greater circulation of people in general and certainly a greater circulation of scholars, as we know from Mohibbi, uh, who I agree with you, a very precious source. I like him very, very much. Uh, but I also want to add, when we think that these are two separate entities intellectually, I should also add the fact that there is another structure in Egypt. And to a certain extent, that structure may have been consolidated by Ottoman authorities. Although, as you know, the 16th century is not very well covered, so we don't know that much. But who, uh, you know, who started Sheikh Al-Azhar? Who made Azhar the most prominent madrasa? It was not the most prominent madrasa in the 15th century. It became the most prominent madrasa. Sheikh Al-Azhar became 
you know, almost uh, number one religious uh, figure in Egypt. Uh, in the, and therefore, uh, there is a structure to allow for promotion. You have to be in the Azhar. Uh, this is one point. I have a tiny secondary point to make. I know it's not part of what you said, but it's part of the bigger picture about exchange. Uh, during a short visit I made to El Sulimaniya, I found tens of copies of works written here in the 16th century. I mean here in Cairo, of course. Uh, the works of Ibn Nujim, for example, became very, very popular. I can't remember how many copies there were, but there were many of his works. Uh, the work of Isharani, very, very, very popular. He was very prolific. Uh, at the time I was in the Soleimaniya, they were using card catalogs. So I can tell you it was more than one, uh, how do you say, one drawer with nothing but Sharani. So there are exchanges, but at other levels. I, I would definitely acknowledge that, and actually I would like to underline that my presentation should not be misunderstood. That I didn't mean to say there were no exchanges. I was looking at the who gets to become the chief judge. The exchanges are much more than we acknowledged so far. I think new studies are actually showing a deeper level of exchange. I came across to some of that in my own work. Uh, I work on Kadazadeh, and he actually has a, a presence. He apparently was, uh, it looks like, in Egypt. And he actually uh, directly studied with Laqani there. And then he comes back to Istanbul and becomes a very major figure. And what he read in Egypt, I think, had a, a great degree of influence. This is just an example I came upon myself, and many other new scholars uh, focus on this, uh, the, these exchanges. There's no question about the deep level of exchange. And also, thank you. Uh, th this just gives me a moment, op opportunity to underline the local structures were very much uh, filled by uh, local scholars. Uh, already, uh, he met, mentioned that. Uh, the, the chief judge who came, as far as I can tell, did not really have a lot of transaction day to day. Even in Hanafi uh, law, there was a local Hanafi judge who actually dealt with most of the daily affairs. I think his presence was more there to look at cases that informs, that are about public law, that in which Ottoman state like, you know, something like a Timariot uh, might be a party. So he was more of a, uh, a supervisor uh, to look at the cases of public law. In the local cases, there is no question that local scholars continued to serve as judges and they produced families of judges. And the, the, the point about al Asar is extremely uh, important. Uh, that I recently came to uh, look at a study, new study. Apparently, al Asar. Uh, it attracted students during the Ottoman era from all over the Islamic world, including uh, Anatolia. There, there was apparently a sort of a college, Rivak, uh, 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 that, that, that was uh, for the Atrak from uh, Anatolia who stayed there. Uh, so the, the, there is no question about that, and that happened under Ottoman rule. Uh, so the internationalization of Al-Assad, uh, it's coming to the current stature, definitely. My point was more about uh, sort of opportunities for advancement in the imperial hierarchy that might bring people to really top positions. A very quick follow-up. Um, given your response to that question, which I, I had the same thought, do you not think that this can push us maybe to do away with a center periphery model of analysis in the first place? It seems to me your talk is still framed within the logic of an imperial center and a periphery, uh, a very kind of old model of looking at uh, the Ottoman situation. Uh, do you think this, this actually invites us to rethink that and perhaps even do away with that model completely? Uh, I think on a a cultural level, intellectual level, I think that would definitely be the case. But I think it would be wrong not to recognize sort of the I I legal imperial power. That power did, did 
mean something when it came down to certain issues, and in that power seems to have been more uh, uh, populated by Anatolians. I, I, I think. I think not recognizing that uh, would not be realistic. But in the intellectual level, in sort of scholarly exchanges, in what they wrote, uh, what the scholars wrote and uh, interpreted and commented upon and uh, exchanged and debated, there is no question that uh, scholars from Arab lands had uh, a big presence uh, in Anatolia. Uh, the, the, the people in Anatolia actually quoted Remli uh, all the time in 17th century. Uh, it's just that the, 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 the issue is the, uh, somebody like Ar Ramli could not become uh, the, uh, get to the center. There was that glass ceiling. That is the point I'm trying to make. Uh, I, 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 you're right. I would definitely push for more even cultural and intellectual exchanges, no borders in that sense. But there is also sort of an administrative structure. Uh, that seems to have been, yes, power, exactly, power. That is what I'm interested in, power. No, sorry. The three different questions, no, four uh, actually, uh, one here, one here, the gentleman there. So um, it connects to what came before. Um, and actually, like, I had the, uh, a problem with the end of your presentation when you presented this other side of like these scholars who came to the Ottoman Empire and were welcomed, but they, none of them came as a jurist. And I think that this is an important factor, even though those scholars that we are talking about, they can be, you know, they can be Adib, they can be Fakir, they can be Sufi, but then like in, in some of these areas, they are welcomed to join in and maybe even get a following of their own. There are also, there is a lot of more cases, especially Maghrebi Sufis who like kind of travel through the Mamluk lands and then arrive uh, in the Ottoman lands. Um, but still we should distinguish there between the, like the Ottoman state, they call out the, uh, ilm, like they, they, they call out the, or they make the call in terms of judiciary and that's, what their system is about and all the other scholarly activities they are left as they are I would say and there you have much more the local traditions whereas in the judiciary there is a center there is a I mean at least if we follow Bur Burak's argument there is a center with the dynasty and the Sheikh al Islam um, at the top and then from there it's it's a trickle down effect at least within this uh, within this state sponsored uh, part of the Hanafi school. And this has then to, to move within the specific local context where I agree with Dalia that it's not that simple that, you know, everything comes from the center, but it comes in with a certain, you know, it, it, it's not, it's also a certain capital that it brings in. That in the end, like what this judge decides is backed up by the whole bureaucracy, whereas the other decisions just happen on the local level. Um, I would also go back to uh, uh, Madame F Furat's uh, talk and ask just two questions. Um, how do you know that those people you're working on are prisoners and not people just, you know, like if I could be uh, uh, the like the, the physician of the, of the Sultan, why, why does that make me a prisoner? Like I don't argue with you about the Caliph, but the other cases I don't see. And then how do you justify uh, calling it colonialist policies so early before the term? Like is a, and you know, like this kind of presumes also like that there are nation states involved or at least on one side. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, according to the Ibn Ayas, uh, they were taken as prisoners. Not prisoner, maybe I'm using the most, uh, the harshest uh, word that I could ever cho choose. That's true. Uh, we were just talking with the p Professor Bozdan a couple of minutes ago, and then he asked me a similar question. How do you know that the, uh, for example, if it, even if it comes to the Caliph, how do you know that actually he was captured? 
So uh, whether he was captured, whether he was taken as a prisoner, it's very much debated question, that's for sure. But in the marriage of Dabuk, if we can just think about the situation, how was the war time, and then most, most of the professors here can just answer this question better, the war time, the conditions in the war. Uh, we just, I mean, according to the historical data, again, resources actually, we know that they were in prisoner, prisoner. but the thing is that uh, the prisoner in this sense, not that was just like captured by hand or something, most probably. They were taken as a prisoner and then they went to the Cairo, then they went to Cairo with the army. So the good thing is that, for example, these, these are two different things. Like uh, certainly the Sultan paid his uh, gratitude, let's say, or paid, uh, uh, give uh, some kind of a comfort to the caliph. And then he said that, where are you from, actually? And then he said that, Baghdad. And we know the story from Ibn Iyas, for example. And then he comforted him and then said that, okay, I'm going to take you to Baghdad and come with me to the, the uh, Cairo. But it's not like, maybe I'm just using the wrong uh, definitions to put it. Maybe I'm just choosing the harsher uh, way to say it. But uh, all of them were involved in marriage to, to some extent. So the second question, I think this is the most important question. Okay, then we can just debate about it, but the, uh, what I was just trying to do was just reflecting the views of the modern scholarship about the thing. So I am not using actually, I'm not saying actually that this was part of a colonialistic behavior of the Ottomans, but I was just uh, trying to tell there are two different views on the issue, modern scholarship, rather uh, from the Turkish point of view, you can say uh, they take it like a, enhancement, like an acquisition of the scholarly works, scholars to Istanbul, or from the other side, they say that, uh, well, so the Ottomans came here as a colonialists, and they took even the books, took all the books, and then take them to, uh, took them to Istanbul. So that was the, for example, in, unfortunately, it's very unfortunate to say that, but in some modern uh, scholarship, you see that also that was the reason why this part of the world was just uh, like in this position afterwards. So uh, this was actually also my, um, let's say my criti uh, criticization to some extent. Thank you for just bringing it up. I'll just give a very short response. What I was trying to say was not that um, it was only jurists who came or not jurists who came, but earlier in the period, before the sort of consolidation of this uh, ulama structure, there were actually Sheikh al-Islams of Arab origin. Uh, the, uh, some of these scholars in the early 15th century who came from Egypt actually became muftis in Istanbul. But we do not see that after that. So once this uh, structure is consolidated and uh, a certain statist interpretation of Hanafi law is uh, put at the core, issues like uh, the interest rate or certain other important points where the interests of the state become very heavy, after that moment, we don't get to see uh, scholars from Arab lands coming and joining the uh, s structure and rising high up, whereas before we did. That is, I think, an important distinction. We have a lot of questions, so please keep your questions direct to the point and show. Yes, I have a question for him, Matt Pei. I wonder whether you could, uh, I wonder what you could say about the spread of the Timar regime, in the Timar regime in uh, Arab lands in the 16th century. Uh, the, thank you very much. Uh, this is a great uh, the, uh, the question, but the the Tamar system and it's, it's spread in the the Bilad Sham, you know, the, is not an homogeneous and unified, you know, the system. There are, you know, the regions where it was applied, and there were uh, the regions where it was not, you know, the uh, the fully uh, the applied. And not all Kanun Names are also uh, the talking about, you know, the Tamar related issues, you know, the. Some of them are more uh, the, the short uh, the taxation related issues and uh, related uh, to the criminal law and, uh, and, and the things like that. But it's. 
more of a north, you know, the, you know, the, I would say north, uh, the, but even then it is, you know, the, throughout the, the, the 16th century there are fluctuations, you know, it's not an, uh, the homogeneous uh, the system, I would say. من موقع التقدير للباحثين يعني لي مداخلة صغيرة وسؤالين لدكتور همة تشكبور هناك ترجمات كثيرة يعني منها لدكتور خليل ساحل أقلو الذي ترجم قوانين نامة آل عثمان هناك مانتران وسوفاجي ترجمة قوانين نامات بلاد الشام إلى الفرنسية وهناك عمر لطفي بركان نشر كل قوانين نامات هلا سؤالي نقطتين بالنسبة لي إلى أي مدى كان هناك تطابق بين القوانين النامات وقوانين المركزية للسلطة لأنه القانون نامة هو توفيق بين التقاليد القائمة في المنطقة والقوانين المركزية والسؤال الثاني إلى أي حد كان هناك تطبيق للضرائب خاصة علما أنه نلاحظ قرارات المهمة دفتري كانت توجه إلى الولايات خاصة في طرابلس تحذر من العودة إلى الضرائب المملوكية كالفراشية والطباخية وغيرها معنى ذلك أن كان هناك خلل في تطبيق القوانين نامات وشكرا uh, شكرا هذا uh, أستاذ uh, 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 للأسئلة يعني بالنسبة للترجمات يعني التي يعني أشرت يعني أنا خاصة أشير إلى الترجمات uh, إلى اللغة العربية في ذلك الوقت يعني لا أريد إلى الترجمات المعاصرة يعني ترجمت من طرف الباحثين يعني أنا خاصة أشير وبالنسبة النشرات من طرف أمير لطفي باركان وأحمد أكندوس يعني موظمهم نعم يعني نشرة ولكن بدون نشر الديباجة يعني الديباجة العربية موظم القوانين الموجودة يعني لهذا هذا القسم كمان أحمد أكندوس في نشره يترك هذه القوانين والمسألة هنا ليس فقط يعني كتابة من الحروف العربية أو نقل من الحروف العربية إلى حروف اللاتينية ولكن التحليل القانوني والمقايسة والمقارنة بين القوانين الموجودة في المنطقة يعني هذا ما أقصد يعني من نشرها بالنسبة للضرائب يعني للترابلوس يعني أنت ده حق يعني هذا يعني التزامات ورجوع إلى الضرائب المملوكية يعني هذا ما ذكرت أيضا يعني هذا ليس فقط يعني قانون العثماني من الضرب من الأعلى إلى الأسفل ولكن يعني حركة التقنين يعني بالمحاتزة وبالمكالمة بالقوانين المملوكية في المنطقة يعني this is the process يعني I am talking about that is very much in conversation with. It is not an abandonment of the fully of the Mamluk system, but it is a long-term uh, the, uh, the process that culminated probably late uh, the 16th century. Uh, I want just to suggest to, uh, uh, to Baki Bey uh, that there was also a, a natural unwillingness on the part of the Arabs or people of the Arab provinces to actually make it into the judicial system because they were reluctant to travel. And uh, in fact, we know some of those who had traveled into Anatolia or more to Istanbul uh, felt 
not because of ethnic prejudice or anything, but felt actually very strange. One of them says, شعرت كالثور الأبيض في القطيع الأسود. So there, there was, I mean, there was a feeling, uh, and people who made it actually as, not as judges, but as scholars, as moderates, and sometimes at the highest level, prefer to retire back and go back to Damascus or to Aleppo. Abdurrahim al-Abbasi that Zeshan mentioned is one uh, notable example. Abdurrahim al-Abbasi was offered one of the most lucrative jobs in Istanbul in the madrasa, but he declined and went back to Cairo. Uh, and I wonder if Abdurrahim al-Abbasi is the epithet Abbasi, if he is a, of the Abbasi dynasty, considering that he was sent to Istanbul mm. on a mission by the Mamluk Sultan earlier. So uh, that's just a comment. The last question. First on the Tarabulus Kanunname, I think that's a good case in point in which, because there are two in effect, one in 1519 and one in 1552. And there, in different instances, at the first and at the second, the Ottomans modify what existed and they precise, and that's, this is a law which only exists and which is an important law on the custom dues. So they precise only for Tarabulus mm -hmm. that uh, 100 zira of uh, that textile will work uh, and have to pay, sorry, this amount of akches, etc. It's only for Tarabulus, but they amend, they change, they, it's an important case, I think, the case of Tarabulus. And the second thing, Perhaps all I these. You said this is also, you know, this is not uh, going idea. ongoing uh. process. It was just a, a addendum. And uh, second one is uh, on the sakmej muallad. I think that may that may be very important because I had just a year ago, I think, I paginated uh, sakmej muallad from Tunisia, mm -hmm. which was for an Ottoman kadı, but who was a Maliki kadı, but it was a for an Ottoman uh, judgeship. Perhaps we have to, yes, power, authority, center, periphery, these are important, but let's go on the ground and check for the different sakmej muasi, which is the procedure of judgment and decision, and then perhaps we can make another sort yeah. of remarks on this. Uh, yeah. Peripheralization, uh, Shafi'it, Malikit, yeah. yeah. Hanafi'it, etc. I think this is very significant. You know, if I, you know, the, uh, respond to your uh, the question, uh, the model, uh, the legal writings, you know, the Sukuk or Al Makhadr was Sijilat, as it was, you know, the called. Um, I'm very familiar with, for example, what existing the, uh, the Sukuk, you know, Sak Mejmas in Khalidiyah Library, you know, the Nazmin Bey, you know, the catalog, you know, the uh, the Arabic, uh, the, uh, the, and all the uh, the uh, the Ottoman uh, the Sak Mejmasis that from you know the mid 16th century till the uh, the mid 19th century, like the Shani Zades, you know the Sak, and then also Musa Zade, uh, the whole um, exist at the Khalidia Library, which is very much you know unifies the the legal language. Uh, the, but when it comes to the Arab provinces, uh, the, there are two aspects of it. One is, you know, the, uh, the daily working language of the court, which was, you know, the Arabic. But there was also another set of registers, uh, which is uh, the uh, registers of the, the Fermans that were coming from Istanbul. They were always recorded in, in, in Turkish. Uh, the mostly, not all of them. Just quick question regarding the uh, the political prisoners, and I think uh, the term surgun must be, you know, the historicized and understood uh, as it's, uh, the full implication. It's not just, you know, the for political purposes. We know uh, the surgun is also, you know, the uh, forceful uh, the res resettlement were an Ottoman policy in the Balkans for, you know, the tribes. But also forceful, you know, the resettlement or uh, the retaking of the scholars are not something uniquely Ottoman. And we know, for example, 
the Timurids were of uh, a similar kind of uh, the practices, and Ibn Khaldun, and the well-known to all of you, you know, barely escaped of his, you know, the Timurs, you know, the own, you know, the, uh, the taking him to the, uh, the Samarkand. Thank you. أسمع أجراس الطعام تدق ولا كلام على طعام. Please join me in thanking our panelists again.